So glad you could all make it here tonight. And it's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Casey. Caitlin was born in uh, Columbia, Missouri. She went to the University of Arizona where she got her degrees in astronomy, physics, and mathematics. She then got her PhD in astronomy from the University of Cambridge. And Pro Professor Casey, what she studies is how galaxies form and how galaxies evolve through time, how they change through time. Her field of interest includes studying galaxies and how they change through time from right after the Big Bang happened up until present day. So Caitlin, you've really managed to narrow down your interests. Right? <laughs> She's won a number of awards for her research, including the Newton Lacey Prize, Newton, Newton Lacey Pierce Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Observational Astronomy. And Professor Casey is one of the leaders of the team examining these images coming back from the amazing James Webb Space Telescope. And tonight, we're lucky to be hearing from her about what this information means for how the universe formed. It's pretty, uh, pretty amazing stuff. And you know, it all started when she was in high school. She had an opportunity to go into the planetarium and uh, play with the knobs and the buttons and lay back and look at the stars in the night sky. And after that, she was all in. And you know what? Odds are that after tonight, at least one of you out here will be all in like that and have a future career in this area. Please welcome Caitlin Case. Thank you so much, Jay. That was a, a very generous introduction. I, it's such an amazing pleasure to be here tonight to share with you some of the thrilling results from JWST. Um, this is data that is fresh, new, uh, super exciting. Uh, astronomers still don't know what to make of it, but I'm, I'm hopefully going to get you a little up to date you know, on what our guesses are so far and how we are uh, maybe breaking the universe. And so it's, it's a controversial title, but um, we'll, we'll get into it um, uh, in, in all the gory detail. So, uh, but before I do that, I want to make sure everyone in the room has an eclipse plan. <laughs> do you have an eclipse plan? Show of hands. Okay, good. If you did not raise your hand, make an eclipse plan now. The total solar eclipse happens on Monday, April 8th. That is a little over two weeks from, two weeks from Monday, this upcoming Monday. Um, and one simple directive here. Be inside of the two red lines. <laughs> you need to be inside of the two red lines to see the total solar eclipse. If you're outside of this zone, you're not going to see the magic, the wonder of a total solar eclipse. Here's a little sneak peek. This is you know, a real image of what a total solar eclipse looks like if you haven't seen one before. Um, I, you know, even though I'm an astronomer, I had not seen one until the 2017 eclipse that crossed the United States, and I was just floored and flabbergasted, and I hope you are too. Make sure you're outside at approximately 1.30 p.m. Go, go out at 1 p.m., don't miss it, okay? Um, and, and look up in the sky. Don't look directly at the sun until the total solar eclipse is actually uh, in place. Here in Austin, uh, the duration will be roughly a minute and a half. If you go towards the blue line, it's going to be uh, upwards of four minutes long um, that the sun is blacked out in the middle of the day. So it's a truly magical experience. Don't miss it. And I hope you all got eclipse glasses outside. Um, OK, so breaking the universe, right? why you all came here today. Uh, I want to share you know, some of the headlines that we've seen from new JWST results, this phenomenal new telescope. Um, Scientific American saying JWST's first glimpses of early galaxies could break cosmology. That sounds um, pretty big. Astronomers spotted something perplexing near the beginning of time from Vox. And then the New York Times, the story of our universe may be starting to unravel. This is pretty, you know, these are big words, okay? If our entire universe unravels, we have a problem, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, but these, these headlines are all based in this very real perplexing issue we've been facing with, with these new data. And so we're going to really dive into it. But before I want to do, you know, show you the new results, I want to just share with you what do we actually know about the universe? What do we think the universe looks like? Okay, so this is a, a movie now showing 
what we think the very beginning of time looks like on the largest scales uh, of, of the entire universe. So it looks like the interior of a sponge, kind of uh, these filamentary um, web of, of gas uh, and matter. It starts out being very uniformly distributed um, across all of space like a soup, but then gravity kicks in. And you have, over cosmic time, gravity makes matter collapse, and galaxies will form in wherever matter is concentrated the most, okay? And over time, more matter falls onto galaxies, and galaxies grow. And they grow into objects we now see today, galaxies like the Milky Way. So this is the backbone of the cosmological model. Um, this is basically the laws of the universe on the largest scales. Okay, other laws of the universe you may be familiar with. What goes up must come down, right? This is gravity. Um, but then in Austin, we have some particular laws of the universe. It's always really, really hot in the summer in Austin. And there's always traffic on Mopac, okay? So, you know, universal truths, okay? Cosmological model, universal truths. Okay, so another universal truth, I bet if, you know, if I asked any of you in the audience here to think up how a city grows with time, you might come up with a picture that looks something like this. You might start with a settlement or a village and over time that grows to a small town and from a town you grow maybe a city the size of Austin that has you know, seen a lot of rapid growth. And you have to you know, hit these intermediate stages before you get a metropolis like New York City. Right? Makes sense? OK. Um, but then I could also ask you the question, how long did it take to build a city like, like New York? Any, any guesses you want to throw out there? Just shout them out. 400 years. 400 years. What? Other guesses? Sorry. 100, okay, you know, 30, no. Okay, the point is, right, like, you know, if I said New York City was built in a day, you'd just, like, laugh at me, right? Because we know, we all know Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Rome wasn't built in a day, New York City wasn't built in a day. All right, I'll just have you think about that uh, question a little bit more, okay? You know, I heard lots of, you know, good guesses, a couple hundred years for New York City. Think about that in the back of your mind as we um, now set more background for, set the stage for JWST. Okay. So to set the stage for JWST, we have to go back to the early 1990s and the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now this was the telescope um, that really affected my generation and was so inspiring to, uh, you know, get, capture these gorgeous pictures of the cosmos for the first time. These are images that I hope you've seen before. Uh, the Pillars of Creation, Hubble brought us this gorgeous image, the Carina Nebula. These are images of regions in space that are forming stars for the first time. And those stars are lighting up in a huge gas cloud uh, that is, is, you know, in this really interesting shape and uh, you know, throwing all of these beautiful colors and complex uh, in this complex formation. Now from stellar birth, we can look at stellar death. Uh, these images are also from Hubble, showing the death process of stars. So these are individual stars that have run out of fuel, and they jettison their outer layers, shedding them um, in, in their last throes, and they pollute space with uh, fresh material that in turn can form new stars and new planets around new stars. Um, so these are iconic images. One of my favorite images, though, from Hubble, and one that I was obsessed with you know, in high school when I decided I, I needed to be an astronomer myself, is the Hubble Deep Field. So have you all seen this image before? I hope, okay. Hubble Deep Field, uh, this is a mesmerizing image, so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Every speck of light that you see here is not an individual star, 
It's a collection of billions to hundreds of billions of stars that are stretched on distances totally unimaginable to uh, humans. Their light has traveled so far that it's taken billions of years to reach us. So this is like capturing the farthest image of deep space that we had before JWST. Um, you can see there are one or two stars in the image. The, the object with the points of light with the cross through it, that, that is a star in our own Milky Way galaxy. So we're staring out from our own galaxy to these other distant objects. And this was a groundbreaking image because we had never done this before where we just stared at what otherwise looked like a blank patch of sky that had nothing in it. Uh, but Hubble had this ingenious idea, like let's stare at a blank patch of sky and see what's there. Um, and over time, these very faint specks of light uh, come, come about. So this image was released when I was 10 years old and I've kind of been hooked ever since. Um, Okay, but these images are also really powerful. A single astronomical image is, is like a time machine. So I uh, love uh, you know, using the analogy, our geologist friends will look at different layers of rock and they'll tell us the history of Earth at different points in time, right? Uh, with you know, some old layers on top, but older layers down below and maybe the oldest layers uh, further down yet. Um, and so this is how we can piece together the history of our Earth. And telescopes can do this too, um, and they're capturing uh, light all in one image, um, but what's phenomenal about astronomical images is we're literally seeing the past as it was. Um, and I'll get to how that works in a second. It's a little hard though to disentangle. It's not like, you know, ordered top to bottom, old, older, oldest, like, like uh, rock layers. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit of a guessing game. Um, maybe that's the old galaxy, that's older yet, and I don't know, is, is that tiny little red speck the oldest? Um, it's a hard problem to figure out, but very powerful. So the reason telescopes work as time machines is because light itself has a limited speed. This is one of those fundamental laws of our universe. It's about 67 million miles per hour. That's very, very fast. And so on Earth, we don't actually see its effects. Light appears instantaneous to us. And that's because the Earth is relatively small. But as we peer out in space, space is really large. And so light, even from our own sun, takes about eight minutes to reach Earth, traveling at this remarkable speed. Um, if we look further yet to Saturn, that light takes about an hour to reach us here on Earth. Um, and we can look to our, the nearest star system outside of the solar system. This is Alpha Centauri. Um, and it is so far that light has taken over four years to reach us, um, traveling at the speed. Uh, and we can go further and further yet. So the Andromeda galaxy, which maybe some of you are familiar with, it, it's visible uh, to the naked eye in the night sky. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful galaxy. Uh, light from Andromeda has traveled two million years to reach us. These are large numbers. So this is, you know, the light leaving Andromeda to, uh, you know, two million years ago. That was before humans existed, um, and just it's reaching us today. Um, it, that that's taken a long time. Okay, and um, so we can keep stepping out. So nearby galaxies. These are the galaxies that we fundamentally use to measure the expansion of the universe. Those galaxies are tens to hundreds of millions of light years away. Um, so, you know, this is like when the dinosaurs existed here on Earth. And when we look at something like the Hubble Deep Field, we're now looking so far in the Earth's past in, on, in terms of time scales that it's several hundreds of millions to billions of years in the past. And the Earth has only been around, you know, four and a half billion years. So. 
we're talking about truly astronomical time scales. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is um, a JWST image. It's of Ur Uranus, the planet, um, and its moons. Um, it's really beautiful, isn't it? Right. So Uranus and its rings. Uh, Uranus has rings, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, it, light from Uranus takes a, about three hours to reach us, but in the same exact image, we have galaxies in the background. Oh, yeah, here are the, the moons of Uranus. Um, literary geeks might appreciate the names. Um, uh, but in the same image, we have galaxies in the background whose light took about five billion years to reach us. So we're capturing this uh, picture of the universe stage at multiple, very, very different times, all in one photograph. So it's really powerful. And this is how we write cosmic history books. Um, so here's the timeline, a very simple timeline of the entire history of the universe, um, starting with the Big Bang. We think the Big Bang happened around 13.7, 13.8 billion years ago. Okay, so here we are today in a spiral galaxy that looks something like the Milky Way. We cannot take a picture of the Milky Way because we're inside of it. Um, and we can look at galaxies that are further and further away. We're looking into the past. We only see any given galaxy at one snapshot in time. We can't watch that galaxy change over time, but we can look at different galaxies at different distances to capture how they're changing with time. So the, the sun and the earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. That's eight to nine billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, the first galaxies that like the Milky Way, spiral galaxies, emerged something like 10 billion years ago. Um, and the very earliest galaxy that Hubble could ever, could, could find, you know, this is the most distant object ever spotted by Hubble. Its name is GNZ11, um, captivating name, I know. Um, it exists at 500 million years after the Big Bang. But there's this period we call the Dark Ages between the Big Bang and 500 million years after that is more or less unknown, uncaptured by Hubble. And this is what JWST was meant to study in detail, to shed light on for the first time. Okay, but now a little lesson. Our telescopes can't see everything, right? Hubble, of course, had this fundamental limit. JWST has some limits too. Um, but it's uh, different in different ways. So quick little lesson um, on, on something that you maybe already appreciate um, using your intuition. Here are three objects of radically different brightness, right? We have a firefly on the left, a light bulb in the middle, and a lighthouse uh, on the right. Now, which object can you see from the farthest distance away? The lighthouse, correct. Um, yeah, if a firefly were at a distance of a lighthouse, say it's like a mile away, you're not gonna see that firefly, right? Because it's too faint. And so telescopes have this limitation. We can see objects that are fainter close by, um, objects that are slightly brighter a little further away, and we can see the brightest objects of all from the farthest distance. This is called Malmquist bias. Um, it is a known effect that when we look to the most distant universe, we can only see the brightest objects. Um, so if we make a cartoon plot of uh, known galaxies in the universe, it might look something like this. We have luminosity on the y-axis. Now this is brightness. Basically, is it a firefly or is it a lighthouse? and distance on the x-axis. So is it close or is it far away? So Hubble has this intrinsic limit. It can see only the brightest objects farthest away. GNZ11 is the very, very tip, the very limit for, for Hubble. Now JWST, it has remarkable power. It was built and has delivered images that are 100 times 
more powerful. They can see objects 100 times fainter than Hubble. Um, so this really lets us peer under the tip of the iceberg. We can now like look underwater, see what is out there, not only seeing objects that are intrinsically fainter, so more like the firefly at really distant, um, large distances, but we can see objects even further back in time um, that are of comparable brightness to some of the objects that Hubble has found. JWST not only gives us uh, greater sensitivity so we can see fainter objects, it also gives us better uh, spatial resolution. So we get sharper images. So this is showing you a comparison. This was one of the first JWST images shown um, in, in its early commissioning stages, the first few months of its operations, comparing a patch of sky that was imaged with two other space telescopes, the WISE mission, Spitzer Space Telescope, and now they went back to the same area with JWST. The difference is stunning. And it's because of JWST's size that we can get this remarkable uh, resolution on, on and very, very deep images. And JWST is also special because it operates at a different wavelength of light. So if you split up light, it has different energies. If you, you know, hold a prism to white light, it'll split it up into a rainbow. Anytime you see a rainbow outside, that's a representation of, you're, you're seeing the energy of light be split into its constituent colors. Red light has less energy than blue light. And so that red to blue spectrum is a part of a broader uh, spectrum that we can't see with our eyes called the electromagnetic spectrum. Hubble Space Telescope operates at the wavelengths that our eyes can see. Um, it, it's optical or visible light. Um, and, and if we look to James Webb, it actually operates at longer wavelengths into the infrared. This is lower energy light. And what's remarkably useful about looking in the infrared is it also lets us see objects further into the past. The light that travels from the furthest objects passes through different phases from ultraviolet to uh, optical and to infrared before it hits the telescope um, and we're able to take, you know, turn it into beautiful images. So this brings us to JWST itself. It's been a very long road to see this telescope happen. Um, at the time um, before its launch, maybe you remember reading news articles about JWST and how long it took to get to launch. It was originally planned uh, for launch in 2007, okay? Um, the final cost was also huge. It was $10 billion to build JWST. It was over 10 times uh, more costly than what was originally planned. Not a great PR for astronomy, <laughs> okay. It was also plagued by m massive delays. Um, and there were tech technical challenges. There was a phase when you know, they shook JWST to just test that it would be okay during launch because launches are very shaky. And uh, all the screws fell out. <laughs> Whoops. So that cost a few years to fix, but you know, I'm glad they fixed it. Um, okay, but um, to put this in perspective, this $10 billion, it's about what the US population spends on potato chips every year, okay? I'm will I don't know about you, I'm willing to give up potato chips per year to make JWST happen. Not that that's, not that, that needs to happen, of course. Um, it also, you know, think broadly, it's funded the careers of 10,000 engineers and scientists. It is a huge project. It's not just a NASA project, it's an international project. Um, and it's really been a huge feat to get it off the ground. So we're really uh, thrilled to have it. So I wanna show you this little movie of launch day. Uh, it launched on Christmas day, December 25th of 2021. Maybe some of you remember it. Here. Okay, here's the video.
It took off from French Guiana. I don't think any astronomer could breathe during this launch. We were all very, very nervous. Um, the launch went off uh, perfectly, perfectly. It was uh, a European Ariane rocket, um, and uh, this is the first Im or the last image we have of the telescope itself. It does not have the ability to take a selfie in space, so this is. <laughs> This is the last glimpse we have of the actual telescope as it detached from the rocket after the launch um, and was sent on its way. Um, it's this beautiful, beautiful image. And it's floating above uh, Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf here um, after launch. It's some, some space debris. But, um, JWST um, is a little different than Hubble. Hubble orbits the Earth, actually, once every 90 minutes. JWST does not orbit the Earth, it orbits the Sun. And it was sent off to a special point in space. Um, it orbits the Sun uh, because the Earth gives off too much radiation. And so it actually has to be v kept very, very cool. It's about five times the distance from the Earth as the Moon is. So it's exterior to, like it's farther than the moon, five times farther than the moon um, in, in, at this little special location called L2. Um, and JWST, uh, the process, you know, even though the launch was successful, everyone was very nervous for about a month afterward because the telescope can't operate just immediately after launch. It had to unfurl and unfold like an intricate piece of origami. There were over 300 single point failures in JWST. Any, any one of those 300 failures could have uh, res, you know, ended the mission. And so uh, these sun sails, the, the base of JWST, those just for context are thinner than a single human hair and they had to unfurl into the size of a tennis court perfectly. Um, they did. Very impressive. Um, this is showing you an image of the mirror of Hubble compared to JWST uh, with respect to the size of humans. Now these are not the biggest telescopes that astronomers have made. Those are actually on the ground. It's easier to make big things on the ground than launch big things into space. Uh, Hubble, the entire enclosure is about the size of a school bus. You can see a full replica at the uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum in, in DC. Um, it's super cool. Um, but JWST is the size of a tennis court, um, much larger and much more powerful. And it's how, that size that gives us that power to see fainter and fainter objects. The very first image that was released to astronomers and the public alike, you know, I saw that the same time that all of you did, um, was in July 2022. Um, it was actually uh, released by the president um, himself. That was a big uh, press event. And it's this image of the galaxy cluster S Max 0723. Um, it's this beautiful image of a collection of thousands of galaxies that are gravitationally bound. This is the largest object in uh, the universe that we know of, our galaxy clusters. And just to zoom in a little bit to some of the detail, we are now able to see individual galaxies where we can detect these little faint dots around them. Those are individual clusters of stars in, uh, in and around these very distant galaxies for the first time. Really exquisite detail. Uh, the same day, the same release, we saw some other exquisite images. This is of the Southern Ring Nebula, um, a, a star in the process of shedding those outer layers, dying. Um, it's really exquisite. Stefan's Quintet, a group of five galaxies that are all closely interacting. Um, really gorgeous. And the Tarantula Nebula, this is, I, I, I love this image. 
of a newly forming star, a star, a star forming region. You can see all that concentration of blue stars in there. Those are all brand new, very, very young stars in their birth cloud. And this image, which probably is the most iconic, is uh, the Carina Nebula or the Cosmic Cliffs. Um, that is also a star forming region uh, where you can just see this contrast of this huge, huge, huge gas cloud and the new stars that were born from that gas cloud. This is uh, the Carina Nebula has a Hubble image as well. So here's the contrast. You can see um, JWST has much better resolution and we're able to see pierce through the cloud and see more of the stars than Hubble was able to see because of the difference in wavelength. If you want to check out more of these gorgeous images, you can download full resolution versions yourself. Uh, if you just Google web image galleries, it's this NASA page. They host all of the original images. Um, so go check, it, check that out. I really recommend it. Now, the things that astronomers uh, geek out about with JWST, um, I, I love showing this contrast. This is, again, the most distant galaxy found by Hubble, GNZ11, if you remember the name. Um, and here we're looking at a spectrum of GNZ11. So we're passing the light through a prism, looking at the different energy of um, light. And GNZ11 has no light, no light, and then some light at the very long wavelengths or low energy light. OK, so this is the best spectrum we have of this most distant object from Hubble. And here it is from JWST. The contrast is incredible, the amount of detail we're able to see. Um, instead of just detecting any little bit of light, now we get this rich amount of information where we can map the chemical signatures. We can actually um, see the presence of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and measure their abundance in this galaxy that was the most distant that Hubble could ever see. Um, it's really groundbreaking. So this brings me back to the headlines. Why is our, the story of our universe starting to unravel? So first, a quick lesson in how we find the most distant galaxies. Here I have five uh, panels that I'm going to flash before you. And I want you to keep your eye on that galaxy in the middle and pay attention to its color because the color of the galaxy tells us how far away it is. So one, two, what's happening to the color? Three, four, five. What happened? It disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> that's a problem. And it also did, what, what happened to the color? Did it get bluer? Redder, yeah, redder, bingo. OK, so the light got redder. Um, as we look for more distant objects, light gets redder. This is an effect of the universe itself expanding. Galaxies in all directions are whizzing away from us at remarkable speeds. This is like the Doppler, Doppler shift. Um, if you're not familiar with that term, let me remind you audibly here. So this is a car passing, honking its horn. Honk, honk, honk. High pitch. And then as it whizzes by us, that pitch goes down. As it passes us, as it's coming towards us, the pitch is high. As it's leaving us, the pitch is low. And light does the same thing. When a galaxy is whizzing away from us, the light becomes redder. That's like the pitch turning down. Uh, if it were whizzing towards us, that pitch would go up. And so galaxies whizzing away, we see redder, redder light. So here we have those five panels. How we actually look at it as uh, professional astronomers is just these boring gray images, um, wh which together add up to a color image. Um, and e the information in each of these panels as a function of the wavelength of light tell us the distance to that object. So we're looking at nearby galaxies on top, and you notice the light vanishes at short wavelengths as, as the distance increases. And you can only pick out the smudge in the center 
at the most distant, at the, the longest wavelength of light. Okay, and we cannot just you know, measure the color, we can also measure the brightness. You can have something only appear in the last three panels, but it could be faint, or it could be really bright. So here are three examples from the brightest to the faintest. And it's this brightness that tells us how many stars are in this galaxy. So you can think about it like the village, the town, and the metropolis. Um, the brightest objects are the metropolises of, of the universe. And this brings us to the universe breakers. Um, the discovery of what astronomers have officially named little red dots, not joking. <laughs> we publish our papers and now we all refer to these as little red dots. Um, this is a paper that came out shortly after JWST launched, reporting uh, a detection of a population. Here they're shown, you can see they're little red dots. That's why we call them that. Um, that ha are so bright, so they have, they're those giant cities, in other words, um, but they are also very red, so they're at the farthest distances, um, and such that they formed within 600 million years of the Big Bang. That's really early. So um, little red dots are like, you know, our cosmic cities, but with the perplexing problem that they formed very quickly after the Big Bang. They've had very little time. It's like each of these cities forming in a day, a couple days, you know, that's not feasible. This is the problem that astronomers are facing, is that how do you form these cities so quickly? How do you form so many stars with so little time after the Big Bang? Um, and you know, when we look around the globe, one thing you can see here is these cities didn't form on the same time scale, right? Cairo has been around for a while. Dubai has not, right? So, so you can see the contrast that not all cities are the same, right? So one thing we really have to do now, we found these little red dots, but we need to learn so, so much more. And this is uh, what we're trying to do with this project I uh, lead called Cosmos Web. This is actually the largest project um, that JWST is, um, has been working on since its launch in its first year. Uh, and we are staring at a patch of sky that's fairly large, I'll show it in a moment, um, for a collective nine days. So we get to use it you know, for nine total days, stare, stare at this one patch of sky to try to piece together where all of these cosmic cities are and, and how they're different from one another. So this is our team meeting. Um, actually, we were meeting the week that those JWST images were released. Um, and we all saw them for the first time together, planning for this big survey. Uh, in Paris uh, in July of 2022. And so I'm gonna show you the image of Cosmos Web here relative to the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So this is the deepest that Hubble gave us after 30 years of its operations here. It ha it's an image that contains 10,000 galaxies, which is a lot. But we're gonna zoom out because it's small, small in comparison to Cosmos Web. Uh, so Cosmos Web is shown here. This is our latest image. I, I also just want to point out, what, what is the scale of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field? If you hold a pencil, just a regular pencil, at arm's length, um, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, that exquisite image, is just the size of the tip of the pencil. It's very small, um, a small patch of sky. With Cosmos Web, we are mapping a much, much larger area, 200 times larger, about the scale, you can see the scale of the moon on the sky there. Um, and this is our image, and in it we have about a million galaxies to look at. So this is a, our Cosmos Web project. I'm just gonna zoom in to show you the level of detail we're talking about. It's very hard to capture in one image. Um, so we're gonna zoom in here. You can see just plethora, let's zoom in again, still looks the same. 
same level of detail. And you have to zoom in one last time before you see kind of the limit of what we're reaching. And so uh, this is a work in progress. This, these are many, many galaxies to sort through. And uh, we're working on it every single day. I spent all day today <laughs> trying to search for really interesting objects. It's a needle in a haystack problem, though. To find the most distant cosmic cities, you have to wade through a million to find 10, maybe 50. So it's, it's a hard problem. So um, I'm just, you know, the last thought I want to leave you with is an explanation. I don't, I don't really have one, but you know, there's lots of uh, theories that astronomers have uh, put out there as to, to explain the formation of these cosmic cities that has happened so, so rapidly after the Big Bang. So what explains these early galaxies? One favorite explanation is that stars and how they form is dramatically different at the dawn of time itself. That the stars are different, that they put out more light, uh, that they live and die way faster. It's like, you know, humans, we kind of know the average lifespan of humans. It's like early humans, you know, it's as if they would only live one year or something. We know that's not true for humans, but maybe stars themselves evolve as well. Um, one wild hypothesis that's, you know, very legitimate is that maybe we're not actually looking at starlight at all. Maybe we're looking at a disk of material that is being sucked into a supermassive black hole, um, the first black holes that ever formed. And uh, we don't understand why, you know, how these black holes form either. Just like it's hard to form cities really quickly, black holes are also a challenge. And then the last idea, which, you know, I think, you know, now we're accepting we don't necessarily need, but what the, these you know, headlines are based off of is, is if we have to tweak the laws of universe, the universe itself in order to explain the formation of these cities. Maybe we got the formula wrong uh, to explain the cosmic framework. Um, and you know, everything that we thought we knew about the universe is wrong. We, we don't think that's actually the case. We don't think we're actually breaking the universe yet, but there's a lot of work to be done. Just the tip of the iceberg. And so I, I want to leave you and take questions, but I, I, I'm going to show you this movie. It's a fly-through of the Cosmos web image. Uh, again, this largest image uh, uh, taken by JWST. Um, it may make you a little dizzy. I hope it's not going to be too fast, but... Um, oh, no. Okay, it will, it will start moving here in a moment. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention. If it makes you dizzy, just look down. <laughs> the cosmos is big. We, we can take questions. It's a, it's, a, it's a long movie. It's six minutes long. So, yeah. All right. We'll take questions as we're watching, as we're flying by. All right. So who has questions? Please raise your hands. And come, to the, come to the aisle. That will help. Yes. And after the Q&A session, we're going to uh, have some door prizes. So hopefully you held on to your, your tickets. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, so it, it sounds like in taking a big field uh, or deep field image like this, um, it's a lot of data, right? And sort of the next steps are like, how do we make sense of it? Um, to what degree has or can, um, you know, technological, like software and technological analysis of these massive amounts of data, like, how much has it been used and or do you see it being used uh, as technology evolves to analyze all this massive data? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're not staring at all of the million galaxies one by one, if, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, we're using um, a lot of measurement techniques uh, from classical techniques that have been developed over decades. In, in short, what we do is, you know, we take these individual images at individual wavelengths. We measure precisely how much light we receive, 
and then we're able to do this automatically. Like find find the patches of light, measure how much light there is, and in each of these filters, and then use that ratio of light to automatically calculate the distance. Um, it's not always right, though, and so we're constantly tuning the knobs to try to improve the algorithms and, and implement new techniques, machine learning. Um, we haven't gotten quite as far as you know, using artificial intelligence to do this, um, but it's definitely something that, that is going to be used over the next few years. Yeah. Caitlin, Caitlin, we have a two-part question here. Yeah. You go first. Has the JWST ever seen a black hole? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so JWST uh, has seen objects that we think are supermassive black holes. Now, I should clarify, it's not looking at the black hole directly. We can't, uh, we don't get light from a black hole. The definition of a black hole is that light can't escape. But we can see the material that is around the black hole because it is really, really hot. It emits light itself because there's a lot of friction on outside of a black hole. So we can see signatures of black holes that are so, so bright, even in these really distant objects, that has led to this idea that maybe we're not looking at starlight at all. Maybe it's light from this disk of material around a black hole. Yeah. And we have, here's part two. Yeah. How bright is a star? How bright is a star? Um, yeah, stars vary in brightness by a lot, actually. Uh, something like a factor of 10,000 between the lowest mass stars and the highest mass stars. So every individual star emits a different amount of light, um, and it's directly, it, it depends solely on the mass of that star. Um, so the most massive stars are the brightest, and they shine really, really brightly, much brighter than the sun. And here's part three. Uh, how big is a star? How big is a star? Stars are really big. Stars are really big. So we could fit, um, uh, okay, something like a thousand Jupiters in the sun, and we could fit something like a thousand Earths in Jupiter. Not sure that was correct. Uh, maybe a couple hundred. I forgot. But okay, I'm gonna be admit I forgot. But it's a large number. The sun is huge. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, what is a black hole? Oh wow, that's a deep question. Very important question. A black hole. Okay, get this. It's um, something that is so massive that it would just take so much energy to escape it. So let, let me first set the stage thinking about Earth. The, the, you know, for you to jump up on Earth, uh, you come down at a certain speed, you know, you feel your weight of your body. If you went to the moon, you could jump up and you would raise, you know, it, you would go really high because the moon is less massive. There's less gravity. Now, you can think in the opposite direction. Jupiter, you'd weigh yourself down. I mean, it doesn't have a solid surface, but details. Uh, and, <laughs> and the sun, if we could step on the sun, which we can't, you would just like not be able to jump because it's so much mass. So a black hole takes that to the extreme. You cannot jump at all. You would, well, you, well, let's not go there. <laughs> it would not be pretty. But um, it's so dense and so massive that nothing in the entire universe can jump off of its surface, not even light. So like if it were shining really brightly like a star, we wouldn't know because that light's going whoop straight back in. So that a black hole is something so massive that light itself cannot escape. Go, go to the back of the line. Are the stars with the little black dots in the middle of them black holes? Oh, in, in this image? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, that's a great question. Great question. But it's just an imperfect image. <laughs> like, so it's just a, a star in the Milky Way galaxy. But because JWST can, is made to see objects that are so faint, it actually struggles to capture an image of uh, stars that are pretty bright. And so it, it, like, it kind of breaks JWST a little bit. So the, the stars that have black dots in the middle, it's just like, whoops, didn't work. <laughs> that image failed. 
Can't do anything about it. Um, the space shuttle. Do you have? Do you guys have like a computer chip in it to where ev when it takes the photo or sees it, that it sends straight to the computer at Earth, or do you have to wait till the space shuttle comes back to Earth to see the image? Great question. So JWST is out there, never coming back. So what happens is JWST takes data. We know when it takes the data, but it takes a while for light to travel back from the from JWST to Earth because it's you know as far as it's a couple seconds or something, um, and so we have to wait. Um, but it's not just waiting for it to beam down the data immediately because there's no internet in space. <laughs> so um, so we actually have to wait to use an array of radio telescopes here on Earth called the Deep Space Network to receive the signal from JWST. Deep Space Network is operating all the time with many different satellites. So it pivots to collect data from all of these satellites that are beyond Earth. And so JWST is one of them. So we usually have to wait about 12 hours. Yeah. Yeah, we'll continue. I just, I just want to thank all the young people for starting us off with such great questions yeah. and having... These are awesome. Having the, the bravery to come <laughs> forth and ask questions because they're really good ones. And I noticed that we're increasing in age. So <laughs> by, by the end of this, maybe I'll be able to ask a question. <laughs> How is a pulsar formed? A pulsar, oh my gosh, wow. Great question. Okay, so a pulsar, folks, is um, basically a giant spinning space magnet, okay? So, so what happens uh, to form something called a pulsar? A pulsar is a, a type of dead star that rotates really, really fast, and it forms through the death of a star, like we looked at some of the pictures of, of stars that died, they jettison their outer layers. If that star was massive enough, the core collapses and forms what's a neutron, called a neutron star, which is a star that's so dense that all of the, it, you know, for folks who know electrons and protons, all of the electrons are crammed into the nucleus of their atoms, and, and they, they, the proton and the electron squash together, form neutrons, and so it's a really, really dense star. If you had a teaspoon of a neutron star or a pulsar, it would weigh like something like the entire, you know, all of Mount Everest. It's like a ridiculous amount. Um, so pulsars are just special neutron stars that are emitting these pulses of light um, that uh, just come off, um, and we measure them with radio telescopes. Yeah. What was before the Big Bang? Well, oh. <laughs> That's like deep. Man, I feel like this is my PhD exam all over again. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so, wow. Um, so, how to say this, but we think time started at the Big Bang. There was no before. That's wild to think about. But yeah, like, um, think about, you know, um, oh gosh. The, a watermelon. Okay, think about a watermelon. Watermelons, like, there is a beginning of the watermelon on one side and the end of the watermelon on the other side. I, I don't know. This is my mental image of time, is like time progresses from one end of the watermelon to the other. I know, it's bizarre. That's how my brain works. Um, but you can think about, okay, what, you know, is there more watermelon outside of the watermelon? No, there's no time before the Big Bang. Time started at the Big Bang, we think. I know, yeah, I, I don't have anything better than a watermelon for you. <laughs> it's a profound question. It's a really good question. Yeah. Do you, do you have any uh, applications to your PhD program? Yeah, you? yeah. Yes. Woo. Keep me on my toes here. So if there was nothing before the Big Bang, oh, how could there be something to create the Big Bang? Oh, go okay, okay. <laughs> oh, man. We're going deep here. Uh, what to say to that? <laughs> um, watermelon seeds. Yeah, watermelon seeds. 
it comes from within. I don't. Yeah, the universe birthed itself. I. Um, we don't. We don't. We don't. No, this is like the question of the origin of everything. Um, but you know, astronomers, you know what what our task is. You know, my brain would explode if I thought about this every day. Okay, <laughs> but um, but astronomers, you know, if we're getting real, like what our task is is to reveal the truth out of any data set. And the universe, every time we learn something new. It's so surprising, and we had no idea. So, you know, the in in the 19, you know, 50s, for example, the idea of the Big Bang was controversial to some of the best known astronomers in the world. Um, but all of the evidence that we collect, that's our job, is to just collect the evidence and and try to understand what the truth is. And the best we can do right now is this bizarre. Bizarre universe, like we think it started 13.8 billion years ago. I don't know why, um, but you know all of the evidence points in this direction, and it's such an amazing job, uh, you know, that I have the privilege of trying to figure that out, and that we live at a time that we can try to figure this out. Um, so you know, keep asking these great questions. <laughs> it's, um, it's really awesome. Um, I, am, I don't have any <laughs> good answer <laughs> other than awesome. that. Yeah, so thank you. Stay there. We'll get to you, and we're going to come over here. Oh, gosh. OK. <laughs> Check out the show. Yeah, watermelons. Mm. <laughs> what is like the other side of a black hole? What would oh. be on the other <laughs> side? Wow, wow. OK, what is? Inside a black hole, yeah. The other side. The other side. So a black, so, okay, great question. So black holes, we think, are balls. They're spheres, you know. So the, like stars, like our planet, you know, they're balls. Um, that's just, like, naturally how things kind of collapse. Like gravity just operates in one direction going in, and that creates, you know, spherical objects. So we think black holes are spheres, and so you know there is. Um, we don't know. We do not know what's inside that sphere, but we can define the edge of that sphere as the point at which light can no longer escape. If you are just outside of that sphere, if you know light happened to come from some material that was whipping around that black hole really fast, we could see it, and as soon as you past what's called the event horizon, the light is gone. It will never emerge from the black hole. It's a great question. Oh, someone throw me a simple <laughs> question. <laughs> How many galaxies have you guys found? Oh, yeah. OK, I like that question. I like that question. <laughs> um, so in our image here, it's a million. One million. Um, it's not exactly a million. I mean, it's about a million. I couldn't tell you exactly because it's, you know, some are questionable. Um, but um, that's how many we have in this image. Now, how many galaxies are in the universe? That's a whole nother matter. Here we're only looking at one patch of sky that's about the size of the moon. But there's a lot of sky, right? And you could look in all directions. Um, in the observable universe, we think there are hundreds of trillions of galaxies, something like that, um, a lot. And each one of those galaxies, again, has up to 100 billion um, uh, stars, which could also have planets and aliens. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Got to mention the aliens. First of all, thank you for this yeah. lecture. This was super interesting. I have a... <laughs> I have a question. So yes. first of all, you say that we can pick up the um, what's it called? The elemental signatures of yeah. like stars such as Z and Z11. Uh, yeah. G and Z11. Is it possible to pick up these elemental signatures for the little red dots? Yes. Yes. And We're trying to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so far, um, I should clarify. Little red dots. We know of. Well, what's published in the literature? What astronomers have all you know found. It's maybe a couple dozen of these little red dots. 
they're found in these really small fields. Now, we, um, one of my graduate students is searching um, Cosmos Web for little red dots. He's already found about 500. It's really amazing. Um, but the next step after you take these images is to go get spectra. So, you know, disperse the light in a prism and try to measure their abundances. And uh, we think this is the way we'll find out if, you know, for example, they're dominated by black holes or if it's actual starlight. So we're, we're working on it hard. We've only had a year, so. Um, and there are some spectra of little red dots, um, but maybe a dozen. And so still TBD what, what they are. Um, this is like a continuation of that question. Yeah. What technologies do you have right now to like find those elemental signatures from the little red dots? Yeah, so what we're working with, um, to the technology we have to use is all on board JWST. So these are objects that are not visible with any other telescope we have on Earth or in space. Hubble can't see them, any ground-based observatory can't see them. So we have to use JWST itself because they're just too faint to see. Um, so JWST, thankfully, has uh, four very powerful instruments, um, but uh, we've only used one of them here. And so our next stage is to use these other powerful instruments. Um, some are just taking pictures and some take spectra of objects. And so we, we're gonna go take spectra of those objects using these four different instruments. But it takes a while to schedule, yeah. Thank you for representing the grown-ups. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for having this session. This is very interesting. But my question is, how do we use, like, well, how do we think of using this, this knowledge? How do we use it for our daily life or to help us? Like, yeah, how that's is this an equally useful? deep question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, astronomers' heads are often in the clouds, right? Like, we, we think about these concepts that are so abstract to our daily lives that you know many people you know you wouldn't be faulted for thinking that this is a very esoteric pursuit uh, that we're just always after something that's so abstract um, but actually a lot of what astronomers do all of the techniques that we use to find the most distant objects in the universe are the same techniques that we use to understand like image analysis of like satellite images of Earth or um, you know, understanding how GPS works. GPS actually exists because astronomers built radio telescopes. You know, and these things that, these connections that are seemingly like totally um, illogical um, have blossomed because astronomers are after these answers that are seemingly so abstract, but a lot of the technology passes back through society in, in really innovative ways. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what can these elemental signatures tell you about how star the first stars were formed differently? Yeah, that's great. So um, when we detect certain bumps in the spectra, they tell us, oh, you know, this is a little bump that tells us about nitrogen and this one is oxygen, and this one is carbon, and this one is neon. And we know from here on Earth what those different elements um, require, the kind of energies that are required to see this bright emission at certain energies of light. And so we can translate that to, oh, there must be so much light of this energy interior to this galaxy that is like billions and billions of light years away. So um, we're able to say, oh, because we see this you know, carbon line, um, the brightness of the stars in this galaxy must be way hotter, like way brighter than, than they are in the Milky Way galaxy. So we're able to piece together this kind of story of what those stars look like, even though we're not able to see individual stars. Is it possible for us to get sucked up by a black hole? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, it's not going to happen. 
<laughs> so that's good. Good news, everyone. We're not going to be sucked into a black hole. So if you were random, so you know, has anyone seen Interstellar here, the movie? Yeah, it was a good film. Um, so in that film, you know, there's some travel close to a black hole, and that's a little nerve-wracking. Um, they didn't get super close to a black hole. If we miraculously figure out space travel um, to astronomical on astronomical distances, which is incredibly difficult and hard for me to imagine is going to happen, but sorry to be a pessimist, but um, <laughs> if we were able to travel close to a black hole, what would happen is a, a phenomenon called spaghettification. <laughs> it's a technical term, spaghettification. <laughs> so it's like you turn into a piece of spaghetti. Um, uh, and that's because the gravity, if you were like standing near a black hole or like floating in space, the gravity that your feet would feel would be so much stronger than the gravity at your head. And so it would just like bloop, tear you apart. <laughs> so don't go to, close to a black hole. What would happen to the universe if the big crunch happened? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So big crunch um, is the concept that, OK, the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. But you can imagine a world where, like, OK, the expansion, expansion slows down, slows down. Then gravity acts in reverse, and everything comes crashing back in on the big crunch. Um, this was kind of a popular idea back in the 80s or so. Um, we've basically ruled it out. It's not going to happen because of a concept that we have, no, we have no idea what this is, but dark energy. Dark energy is this energy that permeates space itself that uh, is like anti-gravity. So it prevents the gravitational collapse of the big crunch. Um, and instead, rather disturbingly, the expansion of the universe is, is uh, rapidly accelerating and ripping everything apart. So big crunch isn't going to happen. Yay. 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 All right, we have time for just a few more. We'll take uh, one or two here and one or two there. What is your <laughs> what is your take on space pollution? Oh, good question. Space pollution, it is a problem, okay, folks. So, so just like pollution on Earth, there is pollution in space, and um, it's currently totally unregulated, which is kind of not cool. And um, anyone can just like launch stuff into space, and it it's turning out to have a a pretty major effect on uh, astronomy and our uh, ability to see um, the night sky. Um, several telescopes the world over, you know, there are these satellites that are just constantly in orbit around Earth to provide, you know, worthy causes like internet to the whole world. Um, but, but they um, make it very difficult to observe astronomical objects. So, um, and they also, eventually, there will be so much stuff that it always is, is running into each other, to, you know, breaking apart into smaller and smaller pieces. Those pieces are traveling really fast. And if you are a person up in orbit around Earth, you're hit by some of the space junk. It's not good. Okay, so it, it's a little disturbing to me because we're, we're launching all of this stuff out into space, and it takes a very sometimes a very long time to come back down. And uh, we're kind of building a cage around Earth, sadly. Um, and, and it's unregulated. So call your, call your Congress people and tell them to regulate space junk. OK, this will be the last question on this. Um, so how do you know that the, like, the light spectrum that we have, or like light energy spectrum that we have, is similar to the light spectrum like in other galaxies or other stars yeah like, wouldn't if we have like a wider one wouldn't that make bigger chances of like knowing or seeing more masses in outer space yeah so i mean we um take spectra of almost all astronomical objects that we possibly can at the end of the day we have way more images of galaxies than spectra because spectra just take more time but we're constantly doing comparisons like, let's take spectra of stars in the Milky Way, compare those to stars in other galaxies. Then we take the 
kind of integrated light of entire galaxies that are nearby and compare them to galaxies that are slightly further away. So when things are nearby, we see more detail. So we're able to see exactly um, what they're made out of, how massive they are, all of these details that we can't see in distant objects, but we constantly do this comparison out and farther out to these um, distant objects. And yeah, we get more information if we get a larger chunk of the spectrum. And JWST has given us this huge chunk that we just never had before. So it's really you know, groundbreaking in that regard. All right, we'll come over here. Is there like a specific reason why they made the James Webb Telescope? Why, why we made it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so making these telescopes takes a very long time. So JWST, the initial planning for JWST started like the day Hubble launched, you know, <laughs> before Hubble was even taking images of the Hubble deep field. Um, and so it's taken decades and decades. But a key mission of JWST is that we, we knew Hubble could only take us so far. It's been to take us into the, you know, towards the dawn of time, into these first few hundred million years of cosmic time that we just haven't been able to see before. Now, I should also say, you know, JWST as a project started when Hubble launched. There are projects starting now that will launch when you guys are maybe working on them, right? In, in 10, 15 years, uh, well, or 20 years, depending on cost, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, those telescopes, they have the mission to take images of the first Earth-like planets around other stars. We still don't have images of Earth-like planets around other stars. So um, there's a lot of work to do, and it's uh, just a really exciting time to be able to work on these new telescopes that teach us more and more about the cosmos. All right, I think we have our last question here. So um, does the universe have an end, and is it going like every single second, or is it infinite? Oh, deep questions. Uh, what is the fate of the entire universe? Yeah, um, <laughs> this is a grilling. This is harder than my PhD defense, OK? <laughs> so so um, the universe, so time will march on. Um, what the end state is, the details are a little, little fuzzy, um, but the universe will continue to expand and expand and expand, and it's actually accelerating in that expansion. The effect that has is this light, you know, as, as it's whizzing away, it's shifted into redder and redder colors. It will actually shift so far we won't be able to see it at all because it'll be receding away from us faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is the speed limit if you're traveling through space, but space itself is expanding faster than the speed of light um, in certain places. So long story short is like, we're just really lucky we can see the universe right now because in 10, 100 billion years, whatever is here in the Milky Way galaxy, we won't be able to see any other galaxies beyond us, which is kind of sad. Um, and eventually all stars die and uh, uh, matter evaporates, uh, leaving nothing. Time marches on. That's the heat death of the universe. I don't, I don't. There are really great books about this. I, I have recommendations if you're curious. Yeah. So we'll do the uh, raffle now, but if you have questions, uh, yeah. I'm sure <laughs> Professor Caitlin Casey will be happy to stick around after we do the raffle of prizes, so you could come up after that. Thank you all for your yeah. awesome questions. Thank Thanks, you. Professor Caitlin Casey.